Um, I'm going to go ahead and ask you if you'd please stand with me at this point, because we're going to be having the reading of our scripture this morning. And we are in Matthew chapter 13, we're in the parables, and I'll be reading the parable of the weeds today. And that's, so that's Matthew 13, verses 24 through 30, as well as the explanation 36 through 43. So I'll go ahead and read, and I can say this is the word of the Lord when I'm done. If you would please join me, we can say together, thanks be to God. Show our appreciation for God and His Word. So starting in Matthew 13, verse 24. He put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the plants came up and bore grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. So the servants said to him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Verse 30. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, I will tell the reapers, gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned, but gather the wheat into my barn. Verse 36, then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. And he answered, to the, the field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to, Thanks God. Be to God. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, the Seventh Church. We're going to jump right into things by being reminded of where we've previously been as we talked about the parables. A few weeks ago, we talked about uh, verses 10 and 17, Father Joaquin, Father Joaquin, showed us the purpose of the parables. The purpose of the parables are to reveal kingdom truths to those who are in the kingdom, and to conceal kingdom truths from those who are not. And last week, Father Jacob walked us through the parable of the sower and its explanation. And we saw the different responses that people have to the message of the kingdom and the call to be discerning Christians. Christ has told us what the responses are going to be, discern what is going on in the lives of others. And uh, we saw that seeking true understanding of the kingdom bears fruit in those who are saved. So in a very similar vein this morning, the parable of the weeds is almost kind of a, a parallel uh, parable, if you will, uh, to the parable of the soils, the sower. And so we're going to ask a very similar question that's going to guide our time in the Word this morning, which is, what secrets of the kingdom are revealed in the parable of the weeds? What secrets of the kingdom are revealed in the parable of the weeds? And so how we're going to go about this this morning is we're actually going to narrate the parable a little bit. We're going to, we're going to walk through kind of the different pieces. We're going to realize that this parable actually would have been somewhat familiar to the people in the land. Uh, they actually would have had context for what Jesus was talking about a little bit. We're going to see how Jesus then conceals kingdom truths. Then we're going to go through this glossary of terms Jesus gives us. He gives us like a dictionary to understand this parable. And then at that point, um, we're going to see there's kind of two main points, two main kingdom truths that God wants to reveal to his people. So our main points are going to come more at the end this morning. So let's sit in this parable. 
what's interesting about this parable is that while the context of the parable is familiar, it's not going to be familiar enough for people to catch the kingdom truth. So let's actually read um, verses 24 to 26 together right now. He, Jesus, put to get another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while his men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bore again, then the weeds appeared also. Something that might not be kind of immediately obvious to us is that this was actually somewhat of a regular occurrence in the ancient world. Regular enough that we actually still today have a historical record of Roman law banning this practice. Uh, like it was like a, I don't know, an act of personal revenge, corporate espionage, whatever you want to call it, right? Uh, where, where enemies would actually get revenge on one another by sabotaging one another's business, livelihood, food. And so Jesus is talking to an agrarian people. I mean, he's sitting in the boat. They're standing on the shore. He's, he's talking to them. I don't know if any of these people would have had this experience, right? If they were maybe some of the servants of a field where they had this kind of experience. But, but they would have known what was going on. What's interesting is um, what's actually going on with the weeds. I don't know if anybody else here hates weeds. <laughs> uh, sometimes we'll... We'll like walk into the house and then I'll disappear for 20, 30 minutes. And my wife will ask me, like, where were you? And I was like, well, there were a bunch of weeds in the sidewalk as we were going in. I had to go take care of them, you know? Um, we, weeds are ugly. They're obvious. I have no idea how they like get in the middle of concrete and break up grass <laughs> and ruin gardens. But, but, they're, but they're obvious. Like you can see them. They look different. They sprout up out of nowhere. They just kind of explode up, right? But what's, what's interesting is that's not what's going on here. They don't notice the weeds. The, the seed looks similar. They begin to sprout. And it isn't until the plants come up and bear grain. It's not until almost near the end of the harvest that people can finally spot that there's been a weed growing amidst the harvest the entire time. So there actually are, like, we actually know of these kinds of seeds. Like, they, they exist. Like, we can, we can go buy some right now. If you really want to go plant some weeds in your garden, you can go do that. Um, but, but what's interesting to note is they did not notice. And so the servant's response, the, the harvest is coming up somewhat soon. It, it, at least it's been a while, right? And what's fascinating is the servant's response in the parable in verse 27. And the servants of the master of the house came and said to him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. And maybe one charitable way to read the servants is that they're confused. Master, we, we know what kind of master you are. Uh, didn't you sow good seeds? But, but more in line with the, <laughs> the tone of these parables and the judgment Jesus is proclaiming, it almost reads more like they're shifting blame. We didn't, we didn't sow those seeds. We didn't, we didn't put the weeds in the field. Didn't you? Like, what kind of, weeds did, what kind of seeds did you give me to sow? Did you not sow good seed in your fields? And the master just kind of instantly knows an enemy has done this. He knows what's going on. He's aware of the reality. The second part of verse 28 reads, So the servant said to him, But do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to be burned but gather the wheat into my barn. So this, the master of the house, the owner of the field, says, don't, don't go ripping up the, the weeds now. I'll give you very particular instructions. Here's what you're going to do for the wheat, and here's what you're going to do for the weeds. And then Jesus just moves on. Like, like, in the story in Matthew, he just moves on to the next parable. And so, I mean, you're, you're a Galilean, right? You're a, a Jewish person who's in the area. You, you have context for what Jesus is talking about. You, maybe you've even experienced this yourself. But, you know, you went to go see Jesus the miracle worker. Like, Jesus the bold preacher. Jesus the apparent messiah. And Jesus just says, 
we're moving on now. So maybe we, we have a clue as to what's going on because we already read the explanation of the passage, right? But, but what would they have understood? It, it's difficult to understand like what, what they actually would have grabbed a hold of. Even with this context, would burning stand out to them? Who is the master of the field? What is the field? It's not, it's not immediately clear. And so Jesus then gives two more parables, which are deeply connected to this one, which we'll cover next week. But then we're going to jump down to verse 36, and, and the scene changes. Jesus tells these four parables now. We've already read two, a parable of the sower and a parable of the weeds. And then he gets off the boat, leaves, and goes home. <laughs> Verse 36, it says, Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. We heard your parables. You explained to us what's going on with the sower. What is going on with the parable of the weeds, Jesus? And Jesus, seeking to actually reveal kingdom truths to those who follow him, gives them the answer. Here it says his disciples came. In Mark's account of this, uh, the section it says that all of his followers came, so those who are following Jesus, who have repented. Uh, and then Jesus decides to give a glossary of terms. <laughs> like, here's, here's the key to the codex. Let me, let me unpack for you what's actually going on here. And so, verse 37. He answered, Jesus, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man. Jesus claimed this title often now, and so instantly the disciples are going to grab a hold of. He's talking about himself. I mean, in Matthew already alone, we've already seen Jesus call himself the Son of Man seven times. In just the last chapter, it came up three times. It is very clear that Jesus is the Son of Man at this point. So Jesus just said to the disciples, I am the master of the field. I am the owner of the house. This is me that we're talking about. This is my land that's, that we're discussing. And as a, as a refresher, we've talked about the Son of Man often. It is a term from Daniel, maybe most prominently. It's a, t- a term used to describe the ruler of reality, the cosmic king. Fascinatingly, it's a term that emphasizes Jesus' divinity while using the word man. Jesus continues in his glossary, in verse 38, he says, The field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. See, Jesus is the master of the house, the owner of the field. The whole world is his. It's his. Not a piece of it. All of the world is Jesus's. We know from elsewhere that Jesus made the world and it will be an inheritance for him one day. And the good seed are the sons of the kingdom. The good seed are Christians. They're all those people of God who have been saved The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. And so up to this point, we might have been able to actually catch a lot of the terms if you're part of Jesus' disciples, right? He gave you the explanation for the parable of the sower, and he's using a lot of similar categories here. But then here we get something new, something that he didn't share in the parable of the sower. There is an enemy who also sows seed. I'm not the only one. And who is it that is being sown? Who are the weeds? They are the sons of the evil one. They are enemies of God's kingdom. They are those who attack Christians and Christian values. And so the picture that we're being seen painted here is that God has intentionally scattered seeds on good soil for those who will be his people. He's placed them just where they're supposed to be. And the enemy has also intentionally scattered seeds to attack those wheat, that harvest. It's not an accident. It's intentional. And so who are the sons of the evil one? All enemies of the kingdom. I mean, we could go on and on about the people who are attacking God's kingdom values. We could go on and on about the people who are attacking God, right? I mean, this morning alone, we've talked about people who are promoting abortion, Talk about people who are destroying families. Uh, there's stuff going on in the world right now, people bribing and lying in order to get out of justice in the court system. There's people who abuse others. I mean, there's so many people who promote promiscuity, 
telling us that it's freedom? People are constantly attacking God's values. They're constantly attacking his character. That's who he is. He's, he's not just telling us random things to do. He's, he's describing who he is and asking us to live in accordance with who he is. And people are then deranging that, slandering God. We need to understand that there isn't a neutral party here. There are just weeds and there are just wheat. There are only people in God's kingdom and people outside of it. And they're not accidentally placed. And then finally, uh, Jesus says, the harvest is the end of the age and the reapers are angels. I don't think I would have caught that the reapers are angels just reading the parable. <laughs> and so that brings us to actually to our first point this morning, the first kingdom truth that God wants to reveal to us. It's this, in the kingdom, God will punish all evildoers in the end. In the kingdom, God will punish all evildoers in the end. There won't be any evilness, any attack on the Lord that will survive uh, the end of God's kingdom. <laughs> and maybe you're like, how is that a secret? Isn't that like so, so much all over the Bible? And the fascinating thing is, is it is a secret. They weren't expecting this. See, see the, common, the common understanding at the time was something radically different. And this is actually Jesus revealing to the apostles what, what the next age is going to look like, what, what, the, what the church is going to look like. And so then it shows up all over our New Testament because he's actually given the apostles the understanding when he was with them and taught them because they had a different understanding at the time. Maybe before that we get there, we'll read kind of the verses that kind of highlight um, how Jesus will punish in the end. So, uh, verses 40 to 42. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. See, we actually live in this reality now, don't we? <laughs> we live in this mixed reality where weeds are surrounding us. See, at the time, many Jews were expecting a great Davidic king, a Messiah who would take the people of Israel and help them rebuild a nation who would defend the borders and allow them to live peaceably in the land. They were expecting a literal nation free from tyranny. Jesus is currently speaking to oppressed people. These people are literally under the rule of someone else who's constantly restricting their worship of God, their way of living. I mean, let's see this. Let's look at the Davidic covenant for a second. So let's look at 2 Samuel 7. This is part of the Davidic covenant in and it says, And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them, so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more, and violent men shall afflict them no more, as formerly. From the time that I appoint judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. And so they were reading this and they were expecting a glorious Jewish kingdom, if you will. And Jesus is actually revealing a different understanding of what's going on. In Hebrews, later on, Paul picks up on Jesus' understanding and says that uh, those who were coming before always understood this to be a future heavenly kingdom. That those who were actually a part of God's people were always looking forward to a heavenly kingdom, and, and those who weren't a part of God's kingdom were expecting something different. And Jesus reveals a different understanding of this, and here is the secret. When the Messiah comes, God's people will continue to live in a mixed reality. They're going to continue to live in the midst of their enemies. 2 Samuel 7 will one day actually be true. There will, in fact, be a heavenly kingdom who's entirely been purified, whose borders are at rest, whose people live peaceably. But Jesus is revealing that that time is not now. So what does this mean? I mean, maybe you're thinking, right, like, yeah, but, you know, I'm not a 50 B.C. Jew. <laughs> uh, that's not what I was operating with. It means we shouldn't expect a Christian nation. 
We shouldn't expect a Judeo-Christian Israel, a Judeo-Christian America. These nations are raging against the Lord. They're pushing back against God's kingdom. They want something different. We shouldn't expect to live in a society that operates as if it was entirely been pure. That's not the age we're living in right now. What we should expect is we actually should expect that the devil himself has intentionally placed our neighbors, our coworkers, our family members, maybe even those that we once thought were in the church, in our lives, choking air, sucking nutrients, attacking God's kingdom. And that's painful. I don't know if you've been slandered for holding to a biblical belief. I don't know if you've been hated on or cursed at. I don't know if you've ever felt abandoned because people who aren't a part of the kingdom take off. Remember the parable of the sower. There are different responses to the kingdom message, different responses to the gospel. And so maybe not every single reality of pain has to do with somebody who's actually been a weed the whole time, right? Uh, We are still sinful beings who hurt each other. But it is a category, and it's one we should expect. We should expect to be intentionally surrounded by the devil's weedy seeds. And so, fascinatingly, Jesus is giving this parable to his followers to encourage them. He's giving it to encourage them. Maybe it doesn't read that way to you. Aren't we talking about judgment and condemning? The problem is, is we actually don't realize how bad this world actually is. We waste time scrolling through our phones, looking at photos of people that, whose lives we'd like to emulate. We watch shows that promote evil and play around with sin. We dream about a certain financial status that will finally make us feel secure. We're playing by the world's rules often. We're getting sucked into a different way of living. We don't realize that the world isn't good. It doesn't have the same principles, the same foundation. It's not operating in the same way that we are operating. God has given us principles and foundations and principles in order to live our lives in his word. And so then when we try and put these things up next to each other, they butt heads, they clash. So Jesus is actually trying to comfort us. You who are being faithful to live in the kingdom you who are actually living according to the kingdom's rules, don't worry, justice is coming. And that might feel hard. We don't actually realize how offensive those who are weeds and, to some extent, our sin really is. Go read the Psalms. The Lord... I mean, these psalmists, they they just constantly sing, like, bring judgment. Lord, have your glory. Lord, I want your kingdom. Because they actually understand that the pain that the world is causing is not good. And so Jesus doesn't hold any punches. Let's look at this slide. I mean, he's talking about what is it going to happen to the weeds? They're going to be burned with fire. The judgment that comes is painful. (laughs) Eternal pain. He's going to throw them into the fiery furnace. I mean, this is like another Daniel reference, right? I mean, it's the only two places this word comes up, fiery furnace. Daniel in here. My people were cast into a fiery furnace because they were being told that they weren't worshiping correctly, and so I saved them. No, 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 no. I, God, am actually going to cast real people who are worshiping falsely into a fiery furnace, and they will be judged. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Often connected to hell, but not always. It's always a phrase used to describe people's reactions to God's judgment. 
even as they experience God's judgment, people actually continue to sin and in anger respond back to the Lord. Jesus was a fire and brimstone preacher. He just proclaimed this to the entire crowds. He proclaimed it to his disciples, and they took this message and they kept going with it. So what is Jesus going to remove from the world? In verse 41, we see that it's not the devil It's not the devil and his demons that are actually going to then take up all the bad people and then go torture them down in hell or something like that. It is the Son of Man and his angels who are going to gather out all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and he's going to give them the justice that they deserve. We don't understand how grievous people are being against the Lord. So what are all causes of sin? This word is translated in several different places um, in different helpful ways. All cause of sin is fantastic. Um, it's also translated as stumbling block, as temptations. Um, it's actually where we get the word scandalous. <laughs> so let's actually look at another passage that uses this same word. In Matthew 18, in, in just a couple of chapters, we get this passage about the little ones who come to Jesus, and Jesus greets them. And this is what Jesus has to say about the little ones. Verse 5, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depth of the sea. And then the the bolded parts of the same word. Woe to the world for temptations to sin, for it is necessary that temptations come, but woe to the one by whom the temptation comes. What are all causes of sin? It's all those people who are actually promoting sin in the world promoting ungodliness, who are breaking God's laws. I I mean, I can can name people, right? I mean, maybe maybe categories would be helpful. I know K-12 teachers who are promoting sin in little ones. I know professors who are passing along false beliefs. We can name politicians who are passing false laws, celebrities that are promoting false religions, false teachers in the church, that are diminishing who God is and his word, doctors that are promoting bad things for the human, parents who are raising their kids not in the Lord, psychologists who break up families, business owners who promote their employees to steal and to trick, family members who continue to push us to make bad decisions. None of these categories are bad. They're wonderful. They're needed. We want wise counselors. We want doctors. We want good teachers. We want teachers in the church. But people are using their platforms to promote others to sin and building something else. They're they're not promoting the kingdom of God. They're trying to drown it and stuff it out. And God is going to remove all of these in his new kingdom. He's going to remove all causes of sin, and he's also going to remove all lawbreakers. What's fascinating to me, and we'll get to this in a second, um, is in verse 43, the clear kind of opposite of lawbreaker is the righteous. (laughs) The righteous is the the lawful one, and that's actually picked up over and over and over in Matthew. Lawbreakers are not righteous. Because we live in a kingdom. I mean, the the field is the, sorry, God's, The field is God's. It is his world. It's all his. And we live in a nation right now that we have rules in, right, that we operate under. I drive a certain speed limit. I pull over when an ambulance goes by. I don't blare my music, you know, too loud at night, right? Um, On and on and on, right? Like, um, I don't, like, desire cruel punishment when we're in court and somebody has done something wrong against me. Like, I don't squash other people's freedom of speech. I mean, these are, these, are, these are the rules of our land, right? Like, and we follow them, and we, we use them, and we live by them, and there's many bad rules and false laws, and there's, there's good ones that promote peace and good living, and we can do that work. And then in the same way, all of the world is God's, and he has rules. He's describing it as a kingdom. 
And so those who are lawbreakers are actually breaking the laws of the Lord. And it's not like the laws are unclear. I mean, they've been written down for a long time. I mean, the Ten Commandments have been there for thousands of years now. And, and, and our Bible is smaller than, I mean, California's tax code, right? Like, and people just plumb the depths of that. And if it's, if it's not good enough to be written, on, written down, which it is, God has said that he's also written it on people's hearts. All people know the rules of the land. And so all will be punished. Maybe you, like me, you immediately go, but isn't this me? I've broken the rules. I've promoted false things. And so praise God that there was one who lived a perfect life, who came not to abolish the law, but to fulfill it, and then lived according to that law perfectly. He now proclaims us righteous. So let's actually read Hebrews 10, a handful of verses together. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. God is king, Christ is king. Waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. That sounds familiar. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And then jumping down to verse 17, this is now the Holy Spirit. Then the Holy Spirit adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Praise God. And so, we live in a mixed reality that will one day be totally purified. So my question for us this morning, one of my questions is, will you patiently persevere in following the commands of the Lord? Will you patiently persevere in following the commands of the Lord? He has laws. He has made them clear. He has set a time when he will return. Will you patiently persevere? Because don't we feel the effects of sin splashing on us all the time? And in our current state, don't, don't we in our sin splash on other people and hurt them too? Praise God that we are now able to choose otherwise, that we can choose to follow the Lord. Peter picks up on this in his, his second letter. I thought it would be helpful to read a handful of verses. He's actually talking about the end of the age. So this is like the context, the first seven verses before 2 Peter 3, verse 8. He's talking about the end of the age. And, but then he says this as an encouragement to those who are following in Christ Jesus. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Verse 11, Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming, coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they are burned. And then finally in verse 13, but according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Are you patiently persevering and following the commands of the Lord? Are you patiently desiring God's kingdom to come? Do you want there to be a pure land that no longer deranges our God? Wait on the Lord. Trust him. His timing is right. Let's live faithfully, holy, godly lives. And our second point, final point for this morning, will be a little bit quicker, because Jesus makes it really punchy. In the kingdom, God will purify all his citizens in the end. In the kingdom, God will purify all his citizens in the end. God will cleanse every wheat, every seed that landed on good soil, 
every Christian, every elect of the Lord, they will be fully glorified. They will be entirely pure. We will become like Christ in being sinless. And so let's read verse 43. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let them hear. Let him hear. And we just see this language everywhere throughout Scripture. I mean, a couple that came to mind, I mean, face shining like the sun. Um, Exodus 34, verse 29. Uh, Moses is up receiving uh, the, the two tablets for a second time. And he, in verse 29, it says, When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two po- tablets of the testimony in his hand, as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the, the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Maybe Jesus is trying to pull forward language again from Daniel, like he's been doing throughout this entire parable. In Daniel 12, 1 to 3, Daniel's wrapping up this book, his scroll, and he says this, At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince, who is charge of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never had been since there was a nation till that time. But as that time, but at that time your people shall be delivered. Everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. There will be a time of trouble followed by a time of deliverance for everyone who has been saved. Verse 2. And many of those who, who sleep in the dust of the earth shall wake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. Or maybe most predominantly in our minds, Jesus taught that his disciples, his followers, would one day shine like the sun, and then some of his disciples actually get to see what that looks like. A few chapters later, Jesus climbs the mount with three of his disciples, in Matthew 17, verse 2, and he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. See, Christian, once all temptation is removed in us, and all temptation is removed in the world, once it's all composed of God's people who want to follow his laws, his rules, once it's been purified, it will literally shine. God is light. We're actually going to reflect some of God's glory. Some of who we are in Christ will actually be displayed for others to see. And so we will live, and we will work, and we will rule, and we will rest with the Son of Man himself. And so, the final question for us today is, will you shine your light now, knowing you will shine later? Will you shine your light now, knowing you will shine later? It's a challenging question. But it's one that Scripture picks up over and over and over again. So let's, let's think about what it means for a quick second to shine our light. Matthew 5, verse 16. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Some of what it means to shine your light is to look for the people God is placing in your life that you are supposed to promote the kingdom in who you're supposed to be proclaiming the message of the kingdom to, who you're supposed to be caring for in this church, in our families, in our communities, so that God might get glory. Ephesians 5, 8, For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the world. Walk as children of light. When you just live your life, is it clear that there is something different about who you are, that you're living by different values than the world? that you were set apart aside from the world? Or do, you, do we look so similar to the world that people can't quite see the difference? Back to Matthew 5, verse 14. You are a light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. We're actually supposed to be clear to those around us that there is actually something different going on, that there's something better. It's, a, it's up high. It's bright, right? <laughs> It's something more peaceable, something more loving, something more gracious, something that's living by a different set of standards. Two more. Isaiah 60, verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. 
Are we slinking back, not proclaiming, not declaring the Lord's truths? Arise, set out. Acts 13, verse 47. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have made you a light for the Gentiles. This is Paul and Barnabas. And they're talking about their description of who they are. I have made you a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. What does it mean to live as light? It's to proclaim the message of the kingdom. Jesus is the one sowing seeds, and he's commanded us to go speak. See, we have everything we need for life and godliness in his word. But we often don't act like it. We don't think of we often want to incorporate other things, and that's not necessarily always bad. The Scripture always wins, and we need to actually have a grid that says what does Scripture say about how to start a family, how to raise a family, how to talk. The Scripture has specific instructions on when to talk, how to talk to neighbors. It tells us how to do ministry specifically. It tells us what our friendship should look like, what our relationship should look like, who gets priority in our life. I mean, the scriptures tell us literally everything we need for life and godliness, right? Isn't that what the word itself says? So let's not act like the world. Let's be a city set on a hill. Let's live by the kingdom. And so I'm going to end our time this morning reading about a third of a psalm. Uh, psalm 37 uh, it's a psalm of David, and uh, you almost read it and you wonder if Jesus had this in mind when he was telling the parables. And so as I read this psalm to you, pray it back to the Lord. Pray that it would be true of you. So let's read Psalm 37, verses 1 to 11. Fret not yourselves because of evildoers. Be not envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourselves over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger, forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it tends only to evil. For the evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. In just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. Let's pray. And so, Lord... Help us to put on heavenly perspectives. Help us to see the world the way that you see the world. Raging, wicked, unrighteous, at odds. We are so prone to thinking things are more gray than that. Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord that you have brought a piece of your kingdom now here to us. You've enabled us to live it out. You've given us your word as instructions of how to live, of who you are. Lord, thank you for the promises you continue to give. Lord, that one day there will be no tear in our eyes. We'll live entirely in peace. All the world will be yours, and we'll get to witness you reigning over the world. Help us to anxiously, in a, in a good way, desire that day. Help us to look forward to that day. And for now, to patiently persevere, doing what you've commanded us to do, trusting that you are wise. We love you, Lord. We are so grateful.
for the seeds that you've planted in our lives to be part of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.